Welcome back to another edition of the Quantum Yoga Podcast. I'm very, very happy to have Dr. Dawson Church, who's an award-winning author and of the best-selling book, The Genie in Your Genes, and uh, numerous other books, including uh, co-authoring Soul Medicine and the EFT Manual, the founder of EFTUniverse.com, and he's the editor of the Energy Psychology Theory, Research, and Treatment peer-reviewed professional journal on energy psychology. Uh, so much more that you've done in your work in the past, and uh, I'm sure even more that you're going to do in your future. Welcome to the program. It's so wonderful to be here, and thanks for the work you're doing in spreading this wonderful news that energy is powerful and affects our bodies, and we're beings of energy as well as beings of matter. So I just love the focus that you've had so far. Oh, good. Well, I, you know, it's funny. Is uh, the thing that I did right before we we uh, linked up here in our in our video call is to listen to your one minute MP3 recording of your laugh, and my. <laughs> Everyone yeah. should do that before they interview you. My goodness, just to get in the same energy field as you. I'm, I, it's, it's beautiful. And uh, I wonder if we could start the, the conversation with a discussion of sort of the historical process that you went through in writing of the books that you've written and that, that pathway that you kind of navigated on your way up to your latest publication. Happily, and an author's history is often traced through their books, even though books aren't meant to be biographical, usually we write about things that are really are of interest to us. My very first book was called Commuting with the Spirit of Your Unborn Child. 30 years ago, I wrote that book on treating childbirth and parenting as a spiritual journey. And it was a powerful book applying energy medicine to working with babies in the womb. And it went on to influence many people because there was nothing back then, 30 years ago, about that. And uh, I, I raised my own three children that way, and they've just gone on to be remarkable beings in their own right. So that was my first big step into that world. And then I, I've done many anthologies. I've done one at, at the height of the last recession. I, I called my collaborator on these anthologies and said, Everyone was just so miserable, and the economy was collapsing. People were losing their homes, losing their jobs. And I said, "We're going to do an, uh, a, an anthology called Optimism." <laughs> and we did, and it's a wonderful anthology. It has all these people, like thirty other other authors. So I did a lot of anthologies. Then went on to write a book with Norm Sheedy. And Norm Sheedy is the founder of the American Holistic Medical Association back in the nineteen seventies, and one of the founding fathers of uh, holistic and alternative medicine in the U.S. And, and internationally. And working with Norm was, Norm mentored me. He was on my dissertation committee for my PhD. And working with him was remarkable because he really had a grasp of how energy affects matter and healing. And he's a walking encyclopedia about this. And so soul medicine is all about the history and the practice of healing and medicine. We also looked at case histories of people who had verifiable cures. And a verifiable cure means you have a diagnosis at the start of the work and a second diagnosis later on. And one of them, one of those diagnoses by a medical professional shows a disease like heart disease or cancer or lupus or fibromyalgia. The second diagnosis after treatment shows that disease is gone and then what people did in the meantime. And so we were able to find many of these examples of medically verifiable cures using energy healing. And that also led me to a project I did collaboratively with some other people where we looked at studies published in peer-reviewed journals of healings and of groups of people usually having healing experience where the method of treatment was overtly energy. And the those methods are are methods like healing touch, like Reiki, like Joe Ray. Uh, we excluded acupuncture and we excluded EFT because they have their own databases. But we found in that research survey there were more than six hundred studies of people getting better from all kinds of conditions. And I happened to grab a list of those conditions recently and take a look at them. I'll just read over a few of them to you, Jonathan. So <clears throat> start with the A's. Alzheimer's, anxiety, 
arthritis, asthma, autism, professional burnout, burns, cancer, cardiovascular disease. And I'll skip down to the bottom. I mean, there are many others, drug addiction, fibromyalgia, high blood pressure, HIV, uh, motion sickness, obesity, pain, PTSD, prostate cancer. And the very last few are um, pulmonary disease, smoking, stroke, substance abuse, and thyroid dysfunction. So from A to T, <laughs> there are no Zs in the list so far, but all, that, that, that database of over 600 studies published in peer-reviewed journals shows that people get better from all of those conditions with energy healing. And I then went on to um, write a number of books on EFT or emotional freedom techniques because it's the most popular method of energy psychology and the field needed some stable reference points to do research with and to train from. So I wrote books on EFT for PTSD, EFT for weight loss, EFT for fibromyalgia, and also the EFT manual, the definitive manual, bringing in the research-based method called clinical EFT on how to do EFT. And um, then my really pivotal book was after I worked with Bruce Lipton on the biology of belief and getting that, that book published and out there and making it a bestseller, I, I thought, what's next? What's next in epigenetics? And we know that um, diet affects animals and human beings epigenetically. We know that um, environmental influences affect people and animals epigenetically. We know that, that genes are being turned on and off by experiences from our environment and also by diet and other external inputs. But the crucial question I ask myself is, what happens when the input that is going to our genes is spiritual or emotional? What happens when we meditate? What happens when we do acupressure in EFT? What happens when we meditate? What goes on with our genes? So I wrote the book in 2004, and when I looked around for studies proving that these things affect gene expression, I did a review of the scientific literature, and I wrote the book, and as I looked at, at the research on this, and the research showing that definitively that emotions affect genes, I found zero studies. But I believed I was on the right track because the byproducts of those genes were measurable. Brain waves were measurable. And there were studies showing that EFT affects brain waves and meditation affects brain waves, brain function dramatically. So I found brain waves. I found, again, byproducts of gene expression like stress hormones. When you get stressed, obviously you have a surge of adrenaline, a surge of cortisol in your body, and those are big, those are big complex protein molecules being produced by your endocrine system. Those molecules can be manufactured by your body only if the genes that code for those are being expressed. So we knew that the, the, there were these, these byproducts of gene expression, but there were no studies showing it directly. So in 2008, I then did a revision of the book, and in the second edition of the book, I found 13 studies showing a direct correlation between emotion and gene expression. Just one of those was abused adolescent boys, and it showed that <clears throat> they had PTSD as a result of childhood trauma, and PTSD was associated with direct changes in the genome. Another one was published of abused adolescent and early 20s girls that had been sexually abused when they were small. And they had a wide range of dysregulation in their gene expression, leading to early cancer, leading to obesity, leading to all kinds of diseases. And so 13 studies in 2008. Then in 2013, I did the, the last revision of Gene in Your Genes. And in that book, I found so many hundreds of studies showing that emotions affect gene expression that I had to pick and choose like 15 or 20 of them to highlight. But we, then we were into really interesting stuff, Jonathan, like research showing that the gene expression of mothers who are depressed can be found three generations on. So the grandmother's depressed, and then epigenetically, there are shifts in the mother and the daughter. Other studies show that Holocaust survivors have, they have a wide variety of diseases that produces changes in gene expression. But what's fascinating is that their offspring, their children, and even their children's children are showing epigenetic changes like they were Holocaust survivors and it's 70 years since the Holocaust. And these effects are now downstream 
two generations. In, in, in animal studies like mouse and rat studies, seven generations or more, those epigenetic tags being passed along. So there's just some remarkable research along those lines now. And so that's, that's what I'm writing about in my, my most recent were trying to popularize this stuff because it's often in obscure journals or it's in big journals, but nobody knows about it. And so I'm trying to write about it. I, I have a housekeeper, a wonderful housekeeper, and she and her husband come from Mexico and uh, English is not their first language. And just this last weekend, she was cleaning our house and she gave me a huge hug and said, Dawson, you have beautiful energy. And she hugged my wife as well. We hugged, hugged them and I said, Gemma, you have beautiful energy as well. So, so here we're, we're having this energetic communication. But I want to explain these really difficult scientific concepts to Gemma. <laughs> in language, she and her husband can understand. And uh, so in my books, I try and really, I'm reading really obscure, often very difficult research, and then trying to explain it in a way that you know, first of all, I can understand, and my wife can understand, and Gemma can understand, so we can all understand this and apply this stuff to our lives. That's kind of the tra trajectory of my writing over the last, you know, 50 years. Wow. It's amazing. I, I wonder now if you were to do that same level of review in 2018, how many studies we'd be at that are looking at uh, emotions and the epigenetic influence. Uh, we were fortunate to interview Roland McCready earlier, uh, not not that long ago, and so they they are kind of they're they're involved in this to a certain degree as it's focused on the heart. I've heard you mention heart coherence before in the past, but my God, I just, I love your book, and <clears throat> and uh, so I'm wondering, are you going to do a a third revision at some point, or is there going to be a new book coming out that is is sort of taking a slightly different angle? Well, I have a new book coming out soon from Hay House, and it's going to be a massive book. Uh, we're expecting to hit the bestseller list. We have over 10 million emails going out by people who've said, uh, I'll, I'll mail for you. I'll send it to my list. So people like Jack Canfield, who has over a million Facebook followers, people like Lisa Rankin, many of these people are going to be mailing for, for the book, letting the, the communities know. They're saying this is an incredibly important book. And... Um, what what I've done in this new book is I've looked at the role of energy in creating matter. And we are used to making matter with matter. You build a house, you go and get, a, get an architect, they create blueprints, you go and buy the two-by-fours and the nails and the sheetrock and the roofing tiles, and you, you, you make something that's material out of it. But all of these things begin in our imagination. That architect is, is dreaming up that house. He's meeting with you, and you're sharing information about that house. You're also sharing energy, just like Gemma and my wife and I share with, with our housekeeper. Well, like we're sharing now, we're beings of energy. Uh, HeartMath's wonderful research shows that our heart's electromagnetic field extends about 15 feet away from our bodies, and they put together these amazing tools like their smartphone app to measure heart rate variability. And so we're now showing that energy is shaping matter. And I, I hope hopefully Roland show, shared some of the research showing how profound those effects are down to the level of the DNA molecule. So in my new, my new book is called Mind to Matter. And initially it was called, um, the subtitle was not the final subtitle, but the publisher changed the subtitle to, to call it and I mean, the, the initial subtitle was interesting, but the final subtitle, which they, they settled on, was the astonishing science, astonishing science of how your brain creates material reality. And if you told me, you know, 15 years ago, that your brain creates material reality, I would have said, that's a metaphysical concept. That's not science. Well, there are over 400 studies reviewed in this book, and they show that our brains are creating material reality in all kinds of ways, not just in our bodies in terms of molecules. Like when I think a negative thought, I make cortisol and adrenaline turn on gene expression. But even the stuff around us, water, when you think of thoughts, it literally can change the angle of bond between the two hydrogen and the oxygen atoms in water. So remarkable things happen based on thought and intention. And so that's what the new book, Mind to Matter, is all about. Oh, that's exciting. When's it coming out? It's available for pre-order on Amazon now. 
and the first copies will ship in uh, mid May. I'm actually doing a book release event in New York in early May, and then one in France. I'll do one in, in the, uh, on the West Coast as well. And so we're doing a whole series of events and online events and in person events, book signings, and so on, and really getting the word out there. And, and then the, what I want what I want people to understand is that. Your thoughts are profoundly creative. What do you think when you, you, you might think that that negative thought or negative idea or negative belief you have about yourself or the world or your body is just a thought. It is far more than a thought. It is a creative impulse. It's energy. That energy is shifting your body. The, some of the shifts that I'm describing ha happening in the body are things like stem cells. We need stem cells. Stem cells are the blank cells that differentiate into muscle cells and heart cells and and skin cells and blood cells and all kinds of other cells. So stem cells are our basic healing, um, healing um, ingredient when we're wounded or when we have an insult to our bodies. We need stem cells to travel to the site of the injury and then make muscle, make bone, make skin, replacement cells. And they can morph, they can transform amazingly, just like they're shape-shifting into any of these other kinds of cells. So you need lots and lots and lots of stem cells to be healthy. Well, we've shown now that energy literally drives the proliferation of stem cells. You have more stem cells if you have positive energy and positive intent than if you have negative energy and negative intent. Energy alone is driving stem cell production. It's also driving step, different, different energies drive stem cell migration. Stem cells have to travel from the bone marrow or the places of the creative to the sites of injury. And different energies in our brains literally drive the migration of stem cells to parts of our bodies. And then finally, you need stem cell adhesion efforts to the areas that are needed to heal the wound. And again, a third frequency actually influences stem cell adhesion. So the, the book re re reviews all these studies showing things like, like this, and it's just been an amazing journey to see how energy is shaping our bodies at every moment. Can we do a, a short 101 on what are genes, what's gene expression, what is epigenetics? Just a just a kind of an overview for listeners, because it's not something that we've talked about and really laid a groundwork for in this podcast. We've talked a lot about the biofield and the electromagnetic field of the body, so there's some understanding to that effect. But uh, these things are intimate related. So can you just give us a, a foundation of that knowledge? Sure. So the dominant model of um, of our view of the genome for a long time was that the all of the information for building our bodies, our metabolism, our anatomy and physiology came from within DNA. The actual structure of DNA as a double helix was discovered in the 1950s by Crick and Watson, which they won the Nobel Prize. But genes became infused with this kind of mystical belief that scientists had that it was all in your genes. And so some things are in your genes, like I'm six foot five, I'll never be four foot one, I'll never be seven foot two. Uh, that's just a genetic fact because I'm you know six foot five. And so I have gray eyes. That again is genetic fact. So some some parts of the gene are fixed. And it turns out though that only about that only applies to about 15%, one five percent of the genome. The rest of the genome is is molecules that are being created and destroyed based on epigenetic influences. We didn't know that in the 1950s or 70s or 80s when Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, wrote his final book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. He was a firm believer in his own cooking. And um, he said, everything about you is based on your genes, your aptitudes, your musical ability, your aspirations, your goal, it's all coming from your genes. And that was the theory of genetic determinism, that your genes determine absolutely everything about you, not just those physical characteristics like height and eye color, but even your spiritual yearnings, your, your, your emotional states, your life aspirations, everything is based on the functioning of neurons and physical matter. So the, 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 the writ, writ large, that was the idea that 
consciousness even is what they call the epiphenomenon of matter. So as the idea was that as brains became more and more complex over billions of years of evolution, eventually they gave rise to this phenomenon called consciousness. Pe people became conscious or beings became conscious. So even consciousness was the result of matter. And the materialists still believe that. And there are many materialists who just uh, discount the whole idea of energy in healing and consciousness as a way of creating. So that was the old idea. Genetic determinism, it's all in your genes. And so cracks began to appear in that, in that belief. Bruce Lipton did experiments in the 80s, in the 1980s, showing that the environment around the DNA was able to shape matter. And that was powerful. That was powerful evidence that more was going on here. And a very simple example of the, uh, the way consciousness shapes gene expression is those same stress genes, adrenaline and cortisol. I've done several studies and looking at adrenaline levels and cortisol levels and levels of stress hormones. And what we find is that consciousness is profoundly creative. So for example, if you are, um, if you're faced with a real threat, maybe it, like it's a beautiful day here in Petaluma, California, where I live. Well, I'll take a walk probably in the big public park later in the day. But say I was taking a, a walk in the park and suddenly there were several dog owners in the park with their dogs on the leash. And suddenly a huge, big, great Dane breaks loose from its odor, runs at me, barking, and its teeth are bare and it's dripping saliva these are very messy dogs, great day. I know I'm afraid of as one. And so suddenly there's this huge animal running at me. And so I'm going to have a rise in cortisol and a rise in adrenaline. And that rise will happen really quickly. And the genes that code for stress biochemicals are going to be expressed. So when a gene is expressed, it means it's turned on. The gene is active. Now, those cortisol genes were not active before that dog began barking and pulled away from its leash. They're, 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 they're triggered only by that external threat. And our ancestors learned this uh, in, the, in the course of evolution. Their cells learned to make adrenaline and make cortisol, make these stress biochemicals really quickly in response to objective threats. So 100,000 years ago, a million years ago, my ancestors, if there was the equivalent of the dog, if there was the tiger, if there was the lion, if there was the hyena, they would make stress chemicals in response to those external threats. So that's an example of an epigenetic trigger. This is outside of me. The dog is completely outside of me. And the instruction to make that is not coming from inside my genes. It's coming from external sources. It's being translated by my senses into the awareness of a threat, which is then being translated into me messenger molecules, which tell those parts of my body that make those stress chemicals to make them. So that's an example of an epigenetic object of threat that is now producing an internal biochemical epigenetic event, the, those cortisol genes being turned on. But, so the, the, the dog, maybe, the, maybe the owner grabs the dog, the dog goes away and calms it down and that go, threat goes away, and then my stress biochemicals quickly drop. But what about if that night I am at dinner and I have a group of four or five friends over and I'm describing my day and I'm describing the dog's attack. So now I'm just describing the attack, I'm thinking about the attack, my shoulders are getting tense, my breathing is getting short, my face is getting flushed, my eyes start to tear up, suddenly the energy in the room starts to change, everyone's like, wow, what, what went on there? How did this, this story end? So now there is no external threat whatsoever, and my cortisol's going up, my heart's racing, my breathing's getting shallow, and all of these biochemical events are happening in my body because of my consciousness, my thought alone, I'm producing all of these biochemical events in my body and then carry that to the extreme. Maybe I now develop a fear of dogs. Maybe I'm afraid whenever I'm in the park. Maybe, and this, this happens to people, I develop a fear of even going out of the house. There are shut-ins. There are people who have phobia of the outside world. They're, they're afraid of leaving their house. They have a fear of any open space and they start to limit themselves. Maybe they develop PTSD, and now they're having flashbacks and nightmares, intrusive thoughts. They're remembering the dog attack, or they're having nightmares about the dog attack, or they're having 
um, flashbacks about it. And those are all involuntary phenomenon. Phenomena. Now my whole nervous system and my biochemistry is being epigenetically changed by something going on from outside of me. So that's kind of the, the, the end result of what happens. So epigenetically, I can be shifted by an actual event, a response to an actual object of threat, or by the memory, the subject of memory of something that happened in the past. Either of those can turn those genes on or off epigenetically. There is, uh, in medicine, <clears throat> some aspects of medicine, a lot of people are getting their SNPs run and getting uh, an account of their their single uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, the SNPs, and I wonder if you could place that into this context, um, if at all. I think that it's worthwhile having those tests done. I've had some of them done on myself. They're interesting, but if they're viewed through the lens of genetic determinism, the old model, then people can get really scared about them. I had a, a friend who who, who uh, emailed me and phoned me last year, and she was terrified. She'd been diagnosed with a malignant, um, fast-growing, aggressive form of breast cancer, and she'd had those tests done, and they, that, they, they showed that she had defects in eight genes. And so now her whole mindset is, oh, I'm genetically programmed to have breast cancer. And so seeing those tests through the lens of genetic determinism, they're terrifying. They're, they're your future. What people don't realize is that those genes have to be expressed for that to happen. Just because I have that cortisol gene or I have that oncogene, cancer gene, doesn't mean it's expressed. It might not be expressed. It might be suppressed. It might be silenced as well. So it's not the genes you have. It's what you do with them. It's like a deck of cards. You know, you've dealt these 24,000 cards of your genes at birth, but you know, you know you, that doesn't mean that that they'll they'll be turned on. It's how you play the cards that counts. A poker player can have a very weak hand and still win the game. So it's what you do with your genes that counts. And especially, I'm I'm focused on turning off those genes that code for cortisol and adrenaline, turning off those genes that code for inflammation in your body, and turning on those genes that code for wellness and for immunity. So it's not the genes you have. And the genes reveal in that those tests that are important, nearly as important as what you do with them. So my friend who had again this diagnosis of cancer, it was more than that, because not only was this there this this aggressive cancer they could see in her breast, but there also there's also evidence that it was had spread beyond the breast. And so uh, when she did X-rays and other other scans, thermography and so on, they showed that the cancer was no longer contained inside the tumor that had spread to her lymph nodes in her shoulder. And so they were recommending a radical mastectomy and also removal of big chunks of tissue in her arm because under her shoulder, uh, the lymph nodes, which normally show up as clear, were all clogged with those cancerous cells. They also then found three spots on her lung. So it looked as though the tumor was now metastasizing and um, affecting her lung, the, the three, three, three spots in her lung. So normally when cancer is has spread beyond the primary site, again, they wanted to operate on her the day she got the diagnosis. They wanted to do a, do a biopsy and get her into hospital immediately, straight from the consulting room into the operating theater immediately. And she said, you know, I'm not going to do that. And what she chose to do instead was energy healing. She phoned me. She talked to people in the energy healing world. She began getting energy healing treatments. She began meditating. She got rid of all the stress in her life. She was ruthless in stamping out stress in her life from that moment on. She, her diet was pretty good, but she'd been slipping in her diet over the previous while. So she began to really clean up her diet, get rid of, for example, all sugar, because sugar feeds cancer cells. There's plenty of evidence in, in the medical literature that effect. She cleaned up, cleaned up her, her, her act. She began to, to tap, do EFT, acupressure on herself. She um, asked us to do some energy healing with her. She began to do Qigong every day, and she went through an intensive course of Qigong with the Qigong master. And so she had energy healing and thought and intention to her body. She went back for additional scans about three months later, never did a biopsy, never did any radiation, never did any chemotherapy. And um, the, the, the mass, the tumor was still there, 
But now it was much more solid and it was necrotic. It was dec decaying tissue, which her body was removing. Her lymph nodes began to show clarity again. So from being all plugged up with cancer, cancer cells, now they were showing little uh, light spots in the middle of them as the cancer was being cleared out of her body. And about three and a half months later, her test showed she had no evidence of cancer at all. And again, she did primarily energy healing techniques, self-healing techniques in her for, for herself. So I don't want to present these as a panacea. Some people do need surgery. Some people do need chemotherapy. Some people do need radiation. But running straight to material means of healing without even exploring the energy techniques only gives you the benefit of those material techniques when evidence shows that energy techniques are incredibly powerful and have had an, an effect on a whole range of diseases. So it's, it's really worth exploring them and taking on the responsibility of self-healing, saying, what can I do in my diet, my uh, energy field? What can I do for myself, by myself, that will trigger and initiate the healing process by changing the energy around my body? The, uh, the telomeres <clears throat> are, are an, interesting, an interesting concept in longevity and aging, and I've heard you mention these uh, previously and some of my clients and I uh, test telomeres, and I wonder, can you discuss telomeres uh, in relationship to these things? Yeah, I do review quite a number of studies of telomeres in my new book, Mind to Matter, because telomeres are regarded as the most reliable measure of aging. If you get a telomere test and mail it into the lab, they'll tell you how old you are biologically. In my live workshops, I have a series of slides I sometimes show of identical twins. And identical twins are, are much studied by scientists because they're two people born with that same deck of cards and the same g genome at birth. But if you look at them when they're, and again, if you look at identical twins when they're babies, when they're one, two, three years old, you often can't tell them apart. They're just, they're, they're, they truly are identical. But when they're 14, 15, they look a little bit different. When they're 25, 27, 29, 32, they look quite a bit different. And in my slide presentation, in my, in my workshops, I show them at 50. And at 50, they often look very, very different. And they often, one might get heart disease and one might not. One might get cancer, one might not. One might die. In fact, according to research at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, they die more than 10 years apart. And so when we study their telomeres, we look not at their chronological age, but at their biological age. So you can take, do this test, take the, the telomere test, mail it to the lab, and they'll tell you how old you are, not chronologically in terms of years. So they won't say you're 46 years old, you're 32 years old, you're, you're 91 years old. They'll tell you biologically what age you are. And you might be physiologically and chronologically, you might be 50. But in these telomere studies, looking at identical twins, they'll find that the one, the one twin, even though they're both chronologically 30 years old, the one twin might be biologically, in terms of telomere length, 25 years old, and the other twin, 35 years old. They could have drifted 10 years apart in terms of their health span, their lifespan, their telomere length, just over the course of 30 or so years. So telomeres are this phenomenally useful marker of aging. And all they are is simply the ends of chromosomes. So they're like a zipper. If you pull a zipper down, uh, un unzip a garment, at the end of the zipper, there's a little metal tab that stops the zipper from unzipping. And so that tells the zipper, oh, that you've gone far enough. Same thing with our chromosomes. When our chromosomes divide and our DNA splits into two, there's something at the end of that strand of molecules that it hits and says, okay, you've gone far enough. That's telomerase. And we're born with roughly 15,000 uh, pairs of telomerase in our, on our cells. And then each time our cells divide, we lose one of those pairs of telomerase molecules. And so our telomerase gets shorter. These telomere tails become shorter by about 1% a year. And that's the process by which we measure aging, is how long your, your tails are. But epigenetically, all of these things shift. So stress makes telomeres shorter. Um, 
bad habits, bad lifestyle habits like eating too much or drinking too much or smoking, all of those make those telomere tails shorter. All of those things degrade the length of our telomeres. And so what we're looking at now in meditation and EFT and other lifestyle uh, stress reduction choices like that is telomere length. And we're finding that people who de-stress themselves really protect the length of their telomeres. They have longer telomeres than people who don't in engage in these practices. So there's a lot of research on this. And I, pre I present a lot of that in, in, in Mind to Matter, talk about that as a marker of aging, but as one we can influence by our activities like meditation, like tapping, like grounding, earthing, being in touch with with body, certainly uh, with the earth, uh, certainly by diet and exercise, all of these things are affecting telomere length. And I recommend that people do all of them, that they eat a good diet, that they earth themselves, they ground themselves in contact with the earth regularly, that they meditate every morning, that they tap when they're stressed, and just generally love yourself and help yourself have long telomeres and a biologically long and healthy life. How would one... Um, <clears throat> do a how would one do a self-assessment to look at all these different factors and perhaps triage <laughs> <laughs> triage like which which one of these things are most negatively affecting me and positively affecting me which how do we categorize these inputs or prioritize these inputs and their level of impact is there a way to do that or you just it's the shotgun approach you do everything right I, I love that question. It's a fun question. And um, I'll give you a really surprisingly simple answer, Jonathan. And the answer is, base it on how good you feel. <laughs> like I, I, I do all these live workshops, and people say after the first hour, after the first day, if I, I had a wonderful compliment from a lady who was running a workshop for me. She had been running workshops uh, for a long time, and then she did her first EFD workshop, where she was like the workshop coordinator. And after the second day, she walked up to me and said, Dawson, I've been doing, I've been being a workshop coordinator, it's been my job for 35 years. And I've done, I've done workshop coordination for workshops that train therapists and coaches in gestalt therapy and psychodynamic therapy and family systems therapy and all these different therapies. I have never seen people change so much in 48 hours. It's amazing how good they feel. And that's the essential answer is, how good do you feel? I know if I, we had a beautiful day here in Petaluma yesterday, and I stuck out for half an hour to go on a bike ride. I felt really good. So I felt good, and feeling good is your guide. And so you say, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling better off I tap. I'm feeling better off I meditate. I'm feeling better off my bike ride, my time in nature. But what I do as a researcher is I'm translating that feeling good, subject of feeling into objective biological facts in your body. And those facts are things like hormones and neurotransmitters. Uh, we have a balance in our body of, of neurotransmitters and hormones. And I know when you tell me you're feeling good, I know from research, your cortisol is going down. We did a study last year at Esalen. And we found that after a week at Esalen, tapping away, doing acupressure on, on your body, people's baseline cortisol dropped by 37%. Their baseline of immunoglobulin A, this marker of immune health, rose by 131%. That's like off the charts rise in immune function. So again, their stress is dropping, their immunity is rising after they do that. And they feel good. So I know those things going on in their bodies. I know their levels of serotonin and dopamine are optimizing in their bodies. Their levels of anandamide, the, it's called a bliss molecule because when you have lots of anandamide, you feel really happy. Meditators have lots more anandamide than non-meditators. Monks and people who focus on learning those skills have happy, happy people have high levels of anandamide. Your level of oxytocin, the bonding hormone that makes you feel close to other people, to nature, to the universe, that's rising. So what I do when people feel good is I'm translating all of those into molecular signals in their bodies. But essentially, when you feel good, all of those things are changing. Now, you can get those same effects by um, stimulants. Like if you, if you take heroin, if you take morphine, then you can artificially produce that from the outside. But the, just one of those bliss molecules, beta endorphin, beta endorphins are 20 times as powerful 
as morphine. <laughs> See, what all this chemistry in your head that, that you're creating in your brain by your consciousness, by what goes on in your head, by the brain waves that you have. And so, um, yes, you can produce all these things externally, but you can produce them all internally as well. So I'd say your guide to what to do, what to use, is what makes you feel good. There's the runner's high, and maybe running is your thing. Maybe bicycling is your thing. Maybe walking is your thing. Maybe time in nature is your thing. But I, I, I would generally start with the easy ones and the accessible ones. And the easiest two for me are meditation and EFT. So meditate every morning. Don't have to meditate for an hour, but meditate for 10, 15 minutes. Just do a simple meditation, calm yourself, and shift your, your, your body and brain. So those are the easy ones. Meditation as a baseline of emotional regulation. Being calm with meditation every morning, I think, is, is, is essential. It, it just is so powerful. And what happens to your body is so powerful that you should do that. In, in Mind to Matter, I share the case history of a man called Graham Phillips. And this is, this is outrageous. This, this number I'm going to share with you now, Jonathan, is when I read that number, I was like, how could this be? So this guy, Graham Phillips, was a skeptic. He was a TV journalist. He didn't really believe in all this, this woo-woo stuff like tapping and acupressure and meditation. But he, he'd read some of the research and thought, well, you know, I'm a TV journalist. I'm going to go ahead and try this. I'm going to, I'm going to do an eight-week mindfulness program. And he got together with some researchers at Monash University, and they tested him. They gave him a whole battery of tests, including intensive MRIs, where they used MRIs to map the volume of each part of his brain. He then went on his eight-week retreat, a meditation mindfulness program, and it really, really changed him. After two weeks, he felt much calmer. After two weeks, he had less road rage. He was blowing up at people less often. He had to feel much better after just two weeks of mindfulness. After eight weeks, he finished the mindfulness program, went back to Monash. They put him through the same battery of tests, and his brain was functioning much, much better. He was he had much better brain function, even though his brain was had his energy. The energy output of his brain had dropped quite a bit. His brain was much more efficient. But then they measured his brain volume, and a part of his brain called the dentate gyrus had grown by. 22.8% in eight weeks. And the dentate gyrus governs emotional regulation and it coordinates different parts of the brain to regulate the emotions. So the neural tissue, the volume of neural tissue in his brain had grown by 22.8% in eight weeks. We are rewiring our brains at a furious pace. We are rewiring our bodies with every thought we think, with every emotion we regulate, with every spiritual experience we have, all of these things are producing change. Mind, consciousness, is actually shaping matter. And so that is the effect of some of these practices. They are radically shaping our bodies. And so I recommend, by all means, do nutrition, do exercise, but start off with a baseline of, of meditation in the morning. When you get stressed during the day, spend one minute and tap on acupressure points to EFT and calm yourself back down to that a healthy baseline. Emotional regulation is the key. You can then go ahead and do things like, like diet. For example, um, we have several diet plans, programs that I, I help run. And, and they show that people, when they, when they calm their emotions, then they can, they can not eat the chocolate, not uh, go binge on the cookies, uh, not eat the chips that are putting on weight. So the key to cravings is emotional regulation. The key to a successful marriage is emotional regulation. If your wife or your husband does something that annoys you, you don't scream and swear and you know become a drama queen because you've learned to regulate your emotions. Workplaces, if you can, people are triggering you all the time. If you're reacting not with annoyance, but with love because you've learned to regulate your emotions, that shifts your whole experience. If you're parenting, you will know that, that the parenting children can be really challenging. If you have elderly people in your life, if you have a parent with dementia or Alzheimer's, that produces a huge amount of stress in your life. And if you can self-regulate, that'll improve those relationships as well. So every bit of your life gets better when you learn what Graham Phillips does. You learn those techniques, the, that consciousness shift into emotional regulation. And then it begins to produce changes in the volume of neural tissue in your brain. And then produces biochemical changes in your body. Your cortisol goes down. That drives your DHEA up 
But that DHA is your, your main cell repair hormone. You have serotonin and dopamine balance. You have more anandamide. You have more oxytocin, so you're, mo you're a more compassionate human being. All of these biological changes are happening, and they're happening purely because you made a choice. Your consciousness decided to regulate your biology and your life experience with meditation and with tapping, and that makes all the difference in the world. So as a recap, uh, <clears throat> we're talking hormones, neurotransmitters, perhaps a heart rate variability, telomeres. These are all... Uh, these are all hard markers that someone could look at to see how they are changing and if they've got a positive perspective on, uh, on change, a growth, growth mindset, we'll say, that um, you can use these very effectively to look at, not only uh, to kind of calibrate how you're feeling subjectively to what's actually happening objectively. Yes, and what do you know, what do you can associate that objective uh, those objective biomarkers with the subject of feeling, then you don't need to measure the object of biomarkers over and over and over again. You know when you're feeling good that that's what happens. And after a while, you become an addict. Like, I can tell you, I am a complete addict. I am addicted to feeling good. I love serotonin. I want my brain to be awash with serotonin all the time. I just, you know, I wake up in the morning, and I, I, like, like, this morning I woke up, I didn't feel good. I, I, I had this, this bad dream. I, I was worried about a project that's a deadline I'm really behind on. So I'm having all these thoughts just rushing through my mind. Then, I, but those are producing high cortisol, high adrenaline. They're, they're spiking my dopamine, higher than I like it to be. All these, these things are happening, depressing my serotonin. So I then meditate. And so I meditate, and after meditation, I feel wonderful. I turn to my wife who's meditating next to me. We smile at each other. We have a connected morning. It's wonderful. So I'm having all these subjective experiences, but all those objective biological things are happening in my, my body, and so now I'm addicted to feeling good. I'm addicted to all those feel-good hormones and neurotransmitters, and I want to create them because they are my new baseline. I'm going to write a book soon about these set points we have in our bodies for these neurochemicals, and how we can change those set points. But that, that again, is you know another 300 pages, another 400 studies, and I won't get to that for another year. Right now, it's mind to matter, the astonishing science of how your brain creates that material reality you live in, in terms of your body and the world around you. I love your your version of meditation. I believe you call it eco meditation, yep. and I love that you preface the thing or the first aspect of it is actually tapping. And so, you know, I'm a regular meditator myself, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to do this. Whoa, that it's a it's it's a it's a turbo. It's like a turbo boost quicker into the experience of calmness, of quiet mind. Uh, and so I wonder if you can just, for listeners that may not be familiar with tapping or EFT, give us a, an overview of what that is and maybe how you incorporate that into your meditation. Sure. Yeah, I, I developed a week of meditation because I am a terrible meditator. I'm just basically a failed meditator. I, you know, I, I, took, I went to live in an ashram when I was 15 years old, and it was funny, my wife, uh, my wife was at Woodstock, you know, she was, she was at Woodstock, she was there for the whole thing, and when I was 15 years old, I was not at Woodstock, I was, I was in an ashram meditating, you know, and so I was trying to learn to meditate, and, and, and meditation teacher said, it is so easy to meditate, uh, the first thing you have to do, there are only three things you have to do, the first thing you have to do is calm your mind, I'm thinking, calm your, are you crazy? Calm my mind, and now I've never been able to calm. I'm a total dud failure, eternal failure at meditation. For the very first time I tried to the present day, so I have a, I have a great record record of over fifty years of failure in meditation. That's what <laughs> get me in the process. I can't, cannot calm my mind. My mind will never just it, it just doesn't happen. So um, I look for a way of meditating that did not involve calming your mind, and that also did not involve believing anything. Because sometimes you have to believe in a guru, you have to believe in a spiritual teaching, you have to chant a mantra, you have to, there's all this you know, religious superstructure. And we have different religions, different beliefs. And that the, 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 the moment you couch meditation in religious terms or spiritual terms, you alienate half the population. So I wanted, I, I wanted to get rid of all of that, that stuff. And so I designed eco-meditation as a simple set of 
instructions to your body. You do certain things physically. One of them you do in eco-meditation, one of the seven steps to eco-meditation. The first is tapping. One of them is letting your tongue be loose on the floor of your mouth. Now, that is a very easy thing to do. Everyone can do that, even though you can't calm your mind. But if you let your tongue be loose on the floor of your mouth, there's a, there's a nerve in your tongue called the hypoglossal nerve. It runs into a nerve plexus in the back of your skull here, and then it runs throughout your body through the vagus nerve. And when you relax your tongue on the floor of your mouth, it sends a signal to the vagus nerve to relax the whole body. And so automatically you relax if you relax your tongue and you can't get emotionally disturbed. If you try and re if you relax your tongue and you're trying to get angry or upset, you just can't do it because the hypoglossal nerve is sending this relaxation signal throughout your body through the vagus nerve to be in this relaxed state. So I look for physiological cues that put you into heart rate variability that make your whole body relax. And so it's just doing seven simple physical things with your breath and your body. It's a super simple way, and it avoids all the spiritual overlay. And you tap to begin with because tapping releases stress from your body. Um, when you do EFT, when you tap, you send a signal to the emotional part of the brain, the midbrain, that all is well. And acupuncture studies show that acupuncture produces immediate deactivation of the fear parts of the brain, the limbic system. So people are anxious and afraid. They're in, a, in an MRI and we're mapping their brain function. When you give them acupuncture, immediately that fear part calms down. And we don't use needles with EFT. We use pressure, acupressure. So it's like shiatsu massage in Japan. So it's just tapping or rubbing on between seven and 12 acupuncture points, and that calms the emotional brain. This stuff is incredibly effective. We now have done this with more than 20,000 veterans. I have a, a nonprofit called the Veteran Stress Project. And the Veteran Stress Project, we, we treat veterans using EFT. We've, to date, treated over 20,000 veterans with EFT, given them free EFT, EFT sessions. And what we find is if they're having flashbacks, having nightmares, having intrusive thoughts, that tapping simply shuts down the fear response in the emotional midbrain. And once you break the association between thinking about the bad stuff, about the bad childhood experience, about being beaten by your dad, or thinking about the mortar attack in Vietnam, or the uh, improvised explosive device in Afghanistan, or the death of your best friend from a sniper rifle in Iraq, whatever it might be, when you pair thinking that thought with acupressure in EFT, it shut down the fear response. You still remember your best friend dying, you still remember the improvised explosive device, you still remember the childhood abuse, but you no longer have an emotional response to it. And then the flashbacks and the nightmares stop. A very common comment we get after people do their very first EFT session is, I got my first full night's sleep where I didn't wake up in the middle of the night since Vietnam. 45 years ago. I mean, people, it, it changes people to do the acupressure. So we begin eco meditation with this simple tapping routine, and that calms them down. And so um, I, that's why I say it's important to calm yourself to set the stage for meditation or any other feel good practice. And so that's why I, I train people in live workshops and online and wherever I can uh, to do these two things meditate and tap. Meditation is the baseline. Tapping is when you're in the middle of the day and you're having a bad thought, tap and quickly release the energy of that thought so you can get back to that calm baseline. I love that. And that's the, that's the work is reducing that refractory period, right? Is that is, that's where the hard work and the grit and the awareness and the, the vigilance of what's happening internally uh, takes hold. And tapping seems to be a, a very quick and, and, uh, an efficient intervention for that. It's a startlingly quick intervention. It's so funny because a lot of people I train are psychiatrists or they're psychotherapists or they're social workers or they're doctors. And so often they're struggling with their own stuff. I mean, doctors are, aren't immune. In one, one study I did called Healthcare Worker Study, we found that clinicians, people, people who are treating other people in hospitals, they are borderline uh, their levels of anxiety and depression are borderline clinical. They're really stressed people. And so they'll then come into a, a live workshop. They'll tap along with me for a few minutes, and they'll often tap on some problem. Like I, I had one psychiatrist who had been biting his nails his whole life long. His nails were all bitten down to the quick. And uh, he'd been been bullied when he was he was a kid. And we worked on the bullying. And again, he's, he's this guy's a psychiatrist. has done all this work on himself. 
and all of the emotional impact of being bullied went away like that. And this guy's like, he was disoriented. He was wandering around the room in a day. It's like, geez, I've had this thing for decades and now it's just gone. And it's just, it's wonderful uh, doing that with people. In We do one module of our live workshops on cravings. We bring chocolate into the room and now everyone's like drooling <laughs> and all craving levels are going up. So like I have one video on my website of, of people at, at one, of the, one of these retreat centers and I asked everyone who had a 10 out of 10 cravings to come to the front of the room. And we had maybe 15 people in the front of the room. And I just did a mass treatment on all of them using EFT. And all of the cravings dropped down to you know, zero, one, two. A few of them dropped into the negative numbers to where they now were holding the chocolate. And they were disgusted and repulsed by that substance that they've been a 10 out of 10 craving for just 30 minutes before. And we, just, we, we, don't, we don't tap much on the chocolate. We tap on the association, the emotional associations you have with mm -hmm. chocolate. And once those, those again, we're, we're teaching them emotional regulation of the limbic system, but not at the level of me convincing you verbally, at the level of a felt experience tapping on acupressure points. When you change the energy body in that way, then the mind and the emotions go right along with it. So just one last point here on your eco meditation uh, question is, if when you do the tapping pre-meditation or as part of the beginning of this meditation, you are not necessarily holding a traumatic uh, emotion or thought in mind, are you? You're. This is a more of a general baseline kind of reset. Can you say that? Yeah. When you when you do tapping for eco meditation, you're just releasing generally in a gentle state to release whatever stands between you and feeling good. But when we're doing EFT as coaching or psychotherapy, so if you're a licensed mental health professional and you have a veteran in your office and they're dealing with psychological trauma, then you are thinking about individual events. You're, you're, you're making lists of events, actually. We have them make lists of the bad stuff that happened in their childhood, being, being beaten by dad, mom being an alcoholic and being out to lunch and them getting divorced and them moving and then, you know, Dad, mom dying of an overdose and all, all this stuff. So we're having them make lists of all that stuff and come into therapy and work on those things one by one with EFT. Now, we're not doing conventional therapy with them. We're not having them talk about the events in any, any great detail. We're just having them think about the events and do the tapping while they do it. And that quickly brings their numbers down to zero, one, or two. So yes, that is thinking about specific events in your, in your, in your biography and it is necessary necessary to do that. It's you have to actually have to have to remember the events, think about them. That again is driving your stress level up, driving your cortisol level up, making you tense. But then you tap and bring it all down again. That breaks the association in the midbrain, in the emotional brain, between what mom and dad did when you were little and being stressed today, fifty years later. And you break that association one time, and the brain is smart enough to f figure out that uh, it's th that that mom drinking herself into a stupor every night what, is not a threat to your survival right now. You're 55 years old. You can handle that stuff now. And once you break that association in the hippocampus, in the middle brain, between the bad stuff of your childhood and the now, you break the association one time by tapping, it stays broken forever usually. Well, uh, D Dawson, give us all of your online information, ways that people can get a hold of you, learn more about you. Just one way, and that is through my website, you can get a free copy of the EFT mini manual and just practice tapping yourself. On the back page, there's a little diagram called EFT on a page. Just turn to the back page and tap and try it out. So uh, that plus the instructions for eco meditation are at my website, which is DawsonGift.com. So it's just my first name, D-A-W-S-O-N, Dawson. G-I-F-T, gift.com, and that's where you get the EFT mini manual. You get the instructions for those seven steps of eco meditation, as well as access to the Veteran Stress Project. If you want to work with one of our certified practitioners, you can find them all there. And again, these people are really good. And we recommend you work with a practitioner if you have severe trauma, lifetime of trauma, if you have abuse in your childhood, if you have persistent problems in intimate relationships, in weight loss, Find a practitioner who's certified and works on that issue, and you can find that whole list of people who've been trained 
by my organization at DawsonGift.com, work with a person and just, you know, start peeling away those layers of the onion. When you do that, Jonathan, it's just wonderful what starts to happen. You start to drop all that trauma and all that old story about why I can't do this, why I can't have a good marriage, why I have to you know, stay 100 pounds overweight, why all this stuff isn't working in my life. And you start to then, once you've dropped all that trauma, who you are starts to shine. And uh, we find that as people just effortlessly move into their full potential when they release all those old stories about their lives. So all of that's available at that DawsonGift.com website.